Here in the rainforest of Central America, a thousand years ago, a great civilization perished. It was already ancient at that time. Born in the days of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, it outlived the Roman Empire and the reign of Charlemagne. But by the time the Spaniards invaded the New World and discovered this startling history, its greatest achievements were long in the past. The classic temples and palaces of the Maya had lain in ruin for five centuries. were part of Mesoamerica, that rich reservoir of Indian culture which extended from El Salvador to central Mexico. From the west, it received nourishment from three related civilizations at La Venta, Monte Alban, and Teotihuacan. The torrid swamplands bordering the Gulf of Mexico produced one of the earliest high cultures in the Americas. Famous for its colossal sculpture of helmeted men with thick lips and flat noses. These huge basalt heads, up to nine feet high and weighing as much as 40 tons, were produced at La Venta and other southern Gulf Coast sites by a people whom we call the Olmecs. Much remains to be learned about the Olmec people who produced this extraordinary monumental art style but their influence was to extend throughout the length and breadth of Mesoamerica. Across the continent near the Pacific coast of Mexico, in the high Sierra surrounding the present city of Oaxaca, rise the extensive ruins of Monte Alban. The Olmecs had built pyramids of earth, but the Zapotecs, who lived here, constructed theirs of finely cut stone. The earliest Zapotec sculpture, thought to date from about 500 BC, shows Olmec influence. Traditionally called danzantes, or dancers, these strangely rubbery, puppy-mouthed figures may represent corpses, the bodies of enemies slain in battle. Many are marked with hieroglyphic inscriptions, which, though we cannot translate them, prove that here, too, the use of writing was known early. The Mesoamerican site most familiar to tourists is Teotihuacan near Mexico City with its two mile long avenue and pyramids of the sun and moon. Its religion, artwork and ideas were exported widely and are found as far away as Guatemala City. Teotihuacan called itself the gathering place of the gods, chief among whom was the feathered serpent still worshipped at the time of the Spanish conquest as Quetzalcoatl. These cultures were all, at various times, in contact with the Maya, a civilization which surpassed them in many ways as it matured to greatness here in lowland Guatemala over a span of 1,500 years. Near the geographic center of this area, the majestic ruins of Tikal, here in an apparently unpromising environment, overgrown with tropical jungle, the Maya attained heights never equaled by any other American Indian culture. Their religion, art, and science all sprang from a profound interest in commemorating the events of their lives in terms of time. Time whose regular intervals were celebrated by the erection of monuments called stelae. The finest artists were commissioned to carve portraits of the gods. On the altar stone, we see a captive or sacrificial victim, hands bound behind. The events were carefully dated, based on precise astronomical observations carried out over many generations. Tikal was an early leader in this culture, which spread through many centers of the classic period. Its temple pyramids tower above the surrounding mahogany and sapote trees, one of them 21 stories high. Maya art was enriched from many sources, 
here one of three platforms at Tikal whose panels and decorative motifs are derivative of Teotihuacan. In all, Tikal comprises more than 3,000 structures and once covered an area of 25 square miles. The central section includes not only temple pyramids, but so-called palaces, sprawling labyrinths which may have served as headquarters, if not residences, of the local lords. Their actual use remains a controversial question. The Maya corbelled arch, capable of only a narrow span, gives these interiors, to our eyes, a cramped and inhospitable appearance. But whatever their function, these buildings, as well as temples, reveal unusual graffiti scratched on their walls. These drawings, sometimes quite carefully made by skilled draftsmen, give us a glimpse of Maya everyday life. Most of what we see at Tikal dates from the late classic period, from the 7th to the 10th centuries. But many earlier structures remain. This fine temple from approximately 250 AD. The Maya destroyed and rebuilt their temples ever higher. Excavation beneath the North Acropolis reveals this giant mask, which predates the temple on the surface by centuries. Lower levels extend back to about 300 BC. Survey, excavation, and restoration of Tikal have taken several decades. It is one of the largest archaeological projects ever undertaken. Inaugurated in 1956 by the University Museum of the University of Pennsylvania in cooperation with the Guatemalan government. Restoration of key parts of the central area is now complete. And Tikal is preserved for the people of Guatemala as a wildlife refuge and national park. The careful work of consolidation has assured that tree roots and weather will no longer endanger the delicate limestone masonry and statuary. Temples, once little more than earthen mounds, have been cleared of rubble and revealed in their original form. The great plaza, heart of Tikal, surrounds the visitor with an unforgettable impression of the classic Maya world. Among the many Maya sites in this broad lowland region, one of the most promising for future archaeological investigation is Kirigua, just over 100 miles to the south. Although only slightly excavated and smaller than Tikal, it is famous for its extraordinary sculpture dating from the height of the classic period. On the sides of Stele, we find dates computed for 90 million years, created at a time when Europeans supposed the Earth to be no more than 5,000 years old. The astronomers of Kirigua had a comprehension of time which would not be equaled in our own civilization until the 19th century. At the end of the classic period, throughout the lowlands, many stele were defaced and some were apparently overthrown, perhaps as part of a mass rebellion. But burying their artwork, whether accidental or deliberate, saved it from erosion. Peculiar to this site are the large carved boulders called zoomorphs, covered with cloud serpent figures and other mythological creatures. These gigantic stones were transported to the site over many miles without the use of beasts of burden or the wheel, for Mesoamerica knew nothing except human muscle power, aided by elementary engineering. This stela is the largest piece of rock ever quarried by the Maya. It was rolled into position on log rollers and tipped upright into its hole before being carved. It weighs 65 tons and stands 35 feet high. The easternmost boundary of classic Maya culture lies only a few miles away across the border of Honduras at Copan. Here, a unique hieroglyphic stairway, 62 steps high and 33 feet wide, carries the longest Maya inscription known. Though now badly weathered, the risers of these stairs carried nearly 2,000 hieroglyphs. 
The stele of Copan are unmistakable for their sensuous, three-dimensional carving. The volcanic stone, though attractive to us, was too drab for Maya taste, and we see here traces of brilliant yellow and red paint. Many Maya inscriptions are as yet undeciphered, but at Copan, they were executed with the skill befitting a center of sculpture and carving. As at Tikal, the stele were accompanied by altar stones. Here, the death god with his fleshless jaws. They come in many shapes and sizes, and though we call them altars, we can only guess at their significance and use. Despite their high intellect and artistry, the Maya were little interested in technology. During several thousand years, their tools remained much the same. It's hard for us to remember that this intricate and polished sculpture was made entirely with stone implements. Beneath this stela at Copan was found buried the only evidence of metallurgy from a classic Maya site, a secret cache of offerings to the gods, which included two tiny fragments of a gold figurine, probably obtained by trade from outside the Maya world. Unlike Tikal, which depended on rainwater, Copan was supplied by this river, which has since washed away many of its ruins. Another riverine site, marking the extreme opposite western boundary of the classic lowland area, is Palenque, 300 miles from Copan in Mexico. Such classic Maya centers were probably not cities as we use the term today, their relatively modest resident population was enormously swelled on festival and market days when the Maya gathered here from their scattered farms to worship and trade. Palenque was their cathedral, their fairground, sports arena, and marketplace. Vivid ceremonies marked the dedication of a new temple or the funeral of an important person, such as the ruler whose tomb was constructed deep within this pyramid. As at Tikal, Temples at Palenque were surmounted by elaborate crests called roof combs to make them even more impressive in the eyes of worshippers. Beneath the palace was built an aqueduct to hide the river Otolum, which otherwise would divide this site in two. Palenque artists are famous for their stucco work, and the portico of the palace is decorated with figures in relief. Here we see a Maya lord, dressed in plumes, carrying the symbol of his authority. Lining the many patios of the palace, we find other figures of stone, who may be captives or prisoners receiving judgment at the Maya court. They show submission by raising one hand to the opposite shoulder. But though we know a great deal about Maya art and intellect, we know almost nothing about Maya government and little about the daily experience of Maya life. We would know even less were it not for the discovery of this unimposing looking building, which in 1946 was publicized to the world by a filmmaker named Giles G. Healy. For here is the fabled Bonham Park, a name which means in Maya, painted walls. The building contains three rooms, each of which is covered, walls and ceiling, with a virtual encyclopedia of scenes at a Maya court. These murals have enabled scholars to reconstruct much more completely the details of ritual, costume, social custom, and life as it was lived in such centers as Tikal, Copan, and Palenque during the 4th to 9th centuries AD. The pigments have been amazingly preserved by mineral deposits on the plaster, enabling us to make accurate renderings, to see, for example, that though the Maya were not a notably warlike people, they did carry out military raids and took prisoners, perhaps for religious sacrifice. The scientist looks to Maya art for information, but the art historian sees it as among the most beautiful created in the Americas, symmetrical pottery made without even the knowledge of the potter's wheel. This ceremonial vessel comes from post-classic times. The design was carved on the surface before the clay was completely dry.
The hallmark of the classic period is polychrome pottery. This, called the Chama vase, shows not black-skinned natives, but Indians wearing black paint. Note the naked lower face and hand. We know the Maya had also books of painted bark cloth called codices, but books from this early period have completely disappeared. Here, in the absence of wheeled vehicles, a Maya lord is carried by the most elegant means of transportation available. The elongated head and sloping forehead shown in Maya painting is not merely an artistic convention. The Maya practiced skull deformation, binding the head in early childhood to prevent longitudinal growth. This distortion, considered a mark of beauty, is accurately reflected in their art. Early sculpture was expressive but crude. Commencing about 300 AD, it gradually assumed that mastery of form which we have seen in the stele and stucco work of their buildings. Even minor figurines, shown in these small pottery fragments, carry a stamp which is undeniably classic. Considering their miniature scale, no Maya sculpture is more eloquent than the hollow clay figures from the island of Haina in the Gulf of Mexico, used anciently as a burial ground. Grave offerings commonly included such figures as this, only five or six inches high. With the ending of the Maya classic period, Maya sculpture style deteriorated. But during the 600 year long interval, all the plastic arts flourished. Carving was not confined to stone, but applied to many softer substances, most of which have decayed, leaving only a few rare examples. The Maya were almost preternaturally skillful in chipping flint and obsidian, not only for utilitarian weapons and tools, but as offerings to the gods. This stone, as brittle as glass, is nearly impossible to chip into shapes such as these without shattering. Nothing, however, better demonstrates Maya skill than their remarkable carvings in jade, one of the hardest minerals known. Using only stone tools, bone and reed drills and sand for grinding, the Maya created outstanding lapidary art. They called jade their precious stone of grace, symbol of green corn and clear water, the essentials of life itself. The classic lowland civilization died out suddenly about 900 AD, but before that time, other Maya centers had taken root in the north, in what is now Yucatan. 50 miles from the city of Merida, the site called Uxmal is one of the greatest of these. We are not certain about its relationship with the other Maya region to the south, but they coexisted over a long period of time. The masonry at Uxmal was never equaled elsewhere. Though we think of mosaics as being composed of many small pebbles, some of these stones are a yard long and weigh several hundred pounds. There are 20,000 of them in this one building alone. In typical Maya fashion, structures at Uxmal were built and rebuilt a number of times. This temple pyramid, unusual in that it has an oval base, is the fifth and final version, and features masks of Chak, the rain god, on its face. Next to the oval pyramid lies a large quadrangle, originally approached by wide stairs leading to its entrance archway. We enter a noble courtyard with four great facades looking down upon it, each ornamented from one end to the other with the richest and most intricate carving, a scene of strange magnificence surpassing any that is now to be seen. So wrote John Lloyd Stevens, a New York lawyer and gentleman adventurer who introduced the Maya to the modern world. Stevens camped in these same ruins in 1841. 
With his companion, the artist Frederick Catterwood, he recorded and published many of these then forgotten Maya artifacts and defended them as products of an indigenous American Indian civilization. Exploration and restoration are still going on. Stone by stone, the buildings and mosaics are resurrected. The Mexican government is now at work rebuilding the Temple of the Dwarf, once the highest structure at Uxmal. But elsewhere, much yet remains to be done. Yucatan contains literally scores of Maya sites, scattered over hundreds of square miles. A near neighbor of Uxmal and a twin city was Caba. These two formed the population centers of the peninsula in the 9th and 10th centuries AD. They shared their late classic culture, their religion, their architecture, and their commerce. A nine mile causeway once connected them and entered Kaaba through a giant corbelled arch. Classic Maya architecture is found even at Chichen Itza, showing that this city too was established before the 10th century. But here we see the radical changes which took place when Mexican invaders called Toltecs conquered the Yucatan about 950 AD. An astronomical observatory, its windows aligning with important positions of the sun and moon, one of which marks March 21st, the vernal equinox. The invaders brought with them the religion of Tula, heir to ancient Teotihuacan. They built this pyramid as a temple to the feathered serpent. The serpent was the patron deity of Chichen Itza, a great hero god who created mankind from his own blood and gave him the priceless gift of corn. The Toltecs called him Kukulkan. In the 12th century, Chichen Itza was a real city, a metropolis whose grandeur was still venerated in the time of Cortes, 400 years later. But it was a Toltec city. By this time, the Maya were a subservient and dominated people. The central area covers two square miles. It contains numerous temples, ceremonial dance platforms, council halls, ritual sweat baths, and a large permanent market. It has six ball courts, the largest of which is bigger than a football field. The sacred game was played at the foot of this temple. The sides of the playing field are lined with long friezes of Toltec warriors in full regalia. Military orders were the eagle, the jaguar, and the puma, all carnivores. Their religion, a bloody one. The heads of sacrificial victims were displayed on the tzampantli, or skull rack. And here, the notorious well of sacrifice, in which hundreds of Maya young people were thrown to their deaths to honor Toltec gods. The lowland Maya civilization had collapsed long since from mysterious causes, but to the far south, in the mountains around Guatemala City, a remnant of Maya culture was to make a fierce last stand. These tribes, living in scattered sites like Ishimche, had experienced a separate history for more than a millennium. Though they spoke dialects of the Maya language and had some contact with the people in the lowlands, by late classic times, they represented a distinctly different society. Individual small kingdoms, perpetually at war with one another, they were scarcely affected by the collapse of classic Maya civilization to the north. Thus they endured until the coming of the Spaniards. Unlike the lowland Maya, who lived virtually without fortifications, these people built their cities into mountaintop strongholds. Behind high walls, they constructed their characteristic twin pyramids and enjoyed the material pleasures of life, for they were rich, supported by profitable trade in the abundant natural commodities of their region. But despite wealth and security, 
they never achieved the level of classic civilization. They had a more healthful climate and a more fruitful environment, but they dissipated their energies in militarism. This city, Mishko Viejo, was one of the last to hold out. It fell finally to the Spaniards when it was betrayed by a jealous neighboring tribe. Where then did the Maya go? The answer is that they are still with us today. The same people speaking much the same languages, observing traces of the ancient religion and the ancient ritual calendar. They still hold their twice weekly market days and pray at least occasionally to pagan gods. But what of the great intellects, astronomers and architects, scribes and mathematicians? What became of classic culture? Why did it collapse a thousand years ago? The answers to these questions we may never know completely. The common people live as they have lived since pre-classic times. Corn is still considered God's supreme gift to man. It is grown in small consecrated plots called milpas, cleared from the forest by burning. But the greatness of Maya civilization has disappeared, like the smoke of burning milpas, leaving no trace behind.